So welcome everyone. Um, I'm Ingrid Kopp. I'm going to be moderating. I'm at the Tribeca Film Institute. Um, and um, I was also born in South Africa and think a lot about these issues. Um, uh, I'm going to actually just, I think, have you guys introduce yourselves very, very briefly. Um, the bios, full bios are on here. So we're just going to do very quick intros and then we're going to get straight into the heart of the discussion. So why don't we start with you, Tobias? Uh, my name is Tobias Janssen. I'm a Stockholm-based producer, uh, producer of the film of the first clip you saw here uh, concerning violence. Uh, I'm also CEO of a production company called Story, and we're producing, well, we have maybe 20, 25 projects at the same time running. So we have a pretty good, pretty big slate of documentaries, mainly. Great, Rachel? Uh, my name is Rachel Boynton. I'm the director of the second clip, and uh, based in New York, independent filmmaker. Uh, I'm Joe Callender, a uh, filmmaker in residence for a company called Saddleback Leather, and I did uh, Life After Death. Great. So um, what we're going to do uh, is kind of go straight into the conversation, but please do jump in at any point. We don't have to wait for the Q&A at the end. Uh, just wait for the, the mic, so put your hand up and we'll send a mic over to you. But we definitely want you to feel like you can just jump in, and I'm sure there are going to be some thorny, meaty issues being discussed, um, so we definitely don't want you to hold back. Um, so Africa is a continent with 54 states often talked about as one entity, um, portrayed often as a place that needs to be saved. Um, I don't think we can ignore the fact that we are four white people uh, sitting up here talking about making films about Africa. Um, so I want to dig into all of these, um, all of these issues. Um, and I think what's really interesting is, you know, in the program for this panel, it described this panel as uh, talk, fil three filmmakers talking about how they avoided the pitfalls of making films about Africa. But I think maybe what we should talk about is, is that actually the case? Um, and how you approached uh, the subject matter and whether you felt right from the beginning that there were <coughs> perhaps things that you had to avoid specifically because you were making a film about Africa. Like, what, I, I guess what I'm saying is, what is it about Africa that seems to uh, bring up these conversations? Because obviously there are lots of places in the world where as documentary filmmakers we go and make films where, and we're not from those places. Um, so what is it about Africa that I think brings up a lot of these issues? Uh, Tobias, do you want to start? Uh, well, what, what we see here is, is I think, a, a very clear example of the problem of representation, because not only is Afri Africa has been, through the, through, through the years, very stigmatized uh, and uh, always portrayed as, as a suffering continent, and not only that, there is also a lacking, lack of uh, representation of, of the own continent by the own continent's images, so to speak. And this is something that uh, is, has been very, very relevant for us uh, while making the film concerning violence. It has also been a constant struggle for me as a producer because I get so much proposals concerning Africa. <laughs> And uh, there are very, very few that I feel that I can even start discussing because they very often have the very one-way uh, attack on the subject. It's depicting something tragic or something, uh, uh, depicting a problem, sort of. And, and that's, that's something that we, we sort of, our film is very much that. Right. So. And, and even with, um, even with <coughs> concerning violence, I mean, obviously you are looking at the struggle against colonialism, but it's still Swedish uh, television folk who are sure. going there to, 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 make, to, to take that footage. Yeah. So we, we had the, the problem, the background problem that I was mentioning, the, the problem of representation. But at the same time, we have this huge archive, this gold mine with, with images from very well, from, from times very close to us that tells us very much about our own times. And it's very hard for us not to do something about it. We have the option, of course, of just letting it rest there. But for us, it was important to, to do something with it and, and to try to create the tool for, for other people. Right. And, yeah. and, and I mean, I should say, you know, I was talking to someone about this panel yesterday and, you know, she was saying, well, I, you know, I, I absolutely don't believe that people can only make films about places or tell stories about places where they're from. I mean, that's just not how the world works and neither, nor should it. 
Um, so I, mean, I don't think any of us would ever say that, True. but it, but 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 <clears throat> they're definitely. I mean, and I've noticed that, and actually the Q and A's for um, the two films I've done concerning violence and life after death, like I can feel that there is a tension around these issues yeah. that there wouldn't be about films about other continents. I, I think. Uh, Rachel, do you want to jump in? I mean, well, the origin of the tension is, I, I think, you know, colonialism, right? I mean, it's a. It, 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 Africa was a colonized continent, and um, I think it, the discussion by a bunch of white people about a predominantly black continent has a lot of political implications. And um, I was talking with him the other day about the lack of representation of the middle class in Africa, which is a huge problem. Um, I, I mean, I think it's important to have the discussion, and you shouldn't avoid the discussion just because we're all a bunch of white people. Um, but it is important to acknowledge it and to recognize the fact that um, I think the difficulties around the discussion come from the history. And, and there's a difficult grappling with that history on all sides. And uh, I think it leads, I mean, that's a very complicated discussion that you can uh, go into for, for a really long time. but. Like, for example, one of the things that I thought a lot about is I've always, <laughs> one of the big themes in my film is about corruption. And uh, I, I have a problem. There, there are a lot of films that I really respect where I don't necessarily respect the politics of the film. I, I might respect the film itself, but not the fundamental message of the film. A, a lot of films that I see coming out of Europe about Africa have this notion of European sort of, the fault of the European, European it's all the Europeans' fault. And I think that's actually really disempowering. I think it's, it's actually a way of looking at the problems that in, a, in, a, in an odd way <laughs> kind of um, is also sort of neo-colonial. Um, but there is a, that's one issue for me. Um, another issue for me is the fact that it is always generally the problems that are looked at. That said, the problems are really, really big. Right. And they're worth looking at. So you shouldn't, should you avoid looking at the problems because it's stereotypical to look at the problems? No. Um, but it is a struggle because, you know, like in my film, I think there are a lot of stereotypical images, right? Which is something I thought a lot about. And, you know, you've got the African kings and the African rebels and the, you know, the government officials and the, you know, it, and, and these, these are, these are images that we have stereotypes about, but the images actually exist. They're real. You know, you go to any village and what do you need to do? You need to go visit the chief. That's how it works. You go, you visit the chief and you bring him a bottle of schnapps because that's how it's done. It's not just a stereotype, it's, it's the reality of the existence. So I think that there's also a difficulty when talking about various African specifically countries that there are these sort of stereotypical images and scenes, especially for a documentary, scenes that come up, and how do you represent those in a conscious way? Do you avoid them? Do you, you know? And I, I, I kind of just sort of go with what I think is true. I and think that's all you can do, right? I mean, I'm white, I'm, I live in New York, that's who I am, um, and so of course my film is made with that lens because that's who I am. But you just have to kind of go with, as you would do with any, any story about any place. You, you have to go with your own sense of the complicated truth and try and recognize your own preconceived notions and confront them in the making of whatever you're making. And do you, do you think, though, that maybe there is, that, 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 that maybe part of the problem is that we are often, go, when, when, when people from the US or the Europe go to Africa to make stories, you know, there, I mean, there are lots of, films about lots of things uh, about other places, but when people go to Africa, they tend to look for the problems. Well, I mean, like my film, I wasn't necessarily looking for a problem. I mean, I w problems make good movies, right? Like, happy, happy doesn't necessarily make a good movie. Conflict makes a good for a good movie. So most movies are gonna be about problems. It's rare to see a movie that's not about a problem. Um, uh, I actually think that critique is a little more valid when it comes to print on things. You know, where you can do like an in-depth examination of something. The like drama is sort of inherent in, at least in what I'm interested in, the documentary form I'm interested in, story. Mm -hmm. So conflict is gonna be an inherent part of what I go trying to find when I'm looking for a story. 
Joe, do you want to jump in? What do you? <clears throat> well, my approach was, uh, you know, at the most basic level, we're all pretty much the same. And I, I hadn't seen too many stories coming out of Africa of just, you know, portraits of normal people. One, because it's tough to get there, and two, because it's expensive, and three, because uh, I don't speak the language. So those are all complicating factors of why films like mine probably don't really exist uh, commonly. Um, but, you know, people just want to have dinner with their friends and work hard and fall in love. It doesn't matter where you live or what country you're from. So that was more uh, a story that was interesting to me, was telling that kind of story in a place like Rwanda. Maybe in the case of Kwazan, working hard is not necessarily his biggest. He may not be the best example for that. <laughs> um, you know, and I think what's, uh, I mean, what, what is really interesting is that how, in, in many ways, I think um, concerning violence and big men really problematize a lot of the issues that come up in, um, sorry, uh, life after death and big men problematize a lot of the issues that come up in concerning violence because obviously, you know, Fernand died, when did he die? 61. 61, yeah. so I mean, it was right in the middle of the, the struggles against colonialism. And then what's interesting in, in big men actually is that you're then dealing with all these issues around the, like capitalism and the circulation of money and, and globalization and the resource curse. And it's actually, you know, like watching, I think it's an amazing double bill actually concerning violence in big men because you see that a lot of that optimism that is sort of there in concerning violence gets really problematized by what happens uh, when you just have money involved. And it's not, it's not a African-European thing. It's not a black-white thing. It's just money corrupting for and me, power. Yeah. For, for me, it was great seeing your film yesterday. It was, uh, it was uh, just, um, no, it was sort of taking, taking, off, taking off work concerning violence ends. And uh, it was, to me, talking about the modern day colonialism in a quite intelligent way. To, to me, it's not really a film about Africa, it's a film about the people going to Africa to... Yeah, I, when I was making the film, I didn't think of it as making a film about Africa. And I say that all the time. I say that I, f I feel like it's a film about how the world works. <laughs> like, it's a film about the workings of the world. It's, it's as much a film about how New York works as it is a film about how, how Nigeria works. And Nigeria was interesting to me because it, it crystallized in this like crazy heightened way things that I saw in the streets of New York all the time. So that I, I was very interested in, in, as you're saying, you know, all people are the same. I'm not sure... I'm not sure I agree with that anymore. I, I think m the making of my film has convinced me that not all people are the same, actually. I mean, I have equal respect for all people, but I actually feel like, I feel like people's backgrounds really do change them. And I think it is one of the problems of making a film about a place that you're not from. I mean, in my film, it's about these white guys from America going to Africa. So there's, there is the advantage of, like, it's not, I'm not, it's not like an anthropological film from, you know, like uh, In the Forest of the Spirits. Is that what it's called? Has anyone seen it? Film that that's here. Yeah. yeah, I really like that film, but it's an anthropological portrait. Um, but I do, I do feel like uh, the fabric, the texture of where you're from really does have a profound impact on your perceptions in ways that you can't possibly comprehend until you confront like a radically different background or a different way of being and of course all of us are making films that are reflective of where we're from and, and how we see mm. so I, I mean I think that's you know there are these initiatives to try and get more African filmmakers financing and things like that um, but it is really important I think to see more stories coming from the places because they will be intrinsically inherently different there's, an, there's actually a really interesting um, uh, blog uh, that Lena Srivastava, um, who works a lot around um, uh, connecting media to impact on the ground, uh, called Regarding Humanity. Mm. And she actually uses it as a space to talk about a lot of these issues around how people get represented and how difference often gets erased, actually. So, you know, thinking about how things like Coney 2012, for example, um, why that became such a, a campaign that really angered so many people. Um, and one of the things that she talks about a lot is this idea of um, the voiceless and how offensive that is. You know, like we often talk yeah. about giving voice to the voiceless, which is one of the most patronizing things you can say <laughs> because everyone has a voice. Yeah. It's just who's listening. 
Yeah. And, and I think uh, uh, Ethan Zuckerman um, at MIT um, has this really interesting idea. He runs Global Voices Online, and he talks about w how one of the most important things you can do is actually amplify local voice, which I think is actually what documentary films can be very, very good about, and anyone can do that. But it's, I think, respecting the difference between giving people a voice and amplify, amplifying voices that everyone already has. Right. Well, like I just saw this film, um, Returning to Homes, Right, which was this film about Syria made by this guy from Syria. And, you know, I, I had certain issues with the film, but the thing I loved about the film was it was clearly, it was made by somebody who was from Holmes. Like, and reading about Syria all the time, it, I, I really appreciated see, seeing this portrait that came from somebody who was there and is of there, because it has its own take on things. And I do, I, 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 I don't think it means that we shouldn't be making films, but I do think it means that there, there should be, there needs to be more, you know, there are many African filmmakers. They don't necessarily have great equipment. They don't necessarily have the resources that they need in, on multiple levels. And they certainly don't have the, often, the distribution resources that we have. So, you know, but that's true on lots of continents. It's not just right. true in Africa. Right. And, but I guess that coupled with the you know the the um, realities of the economic situation in a lot of African countries. It's like it's a sort of double whammy in many ways, right? It's like there are all these issues to deal with, but also the film industry there is very underfunded, even though there are, like you say, a lot of African filmmakers and African film festivals. Well, Nigeria has this really really thriving film industry, but it's like not film industry as Americans would think of film industry. It's like it, everything's super low budget, and it's you know it's very down and dirty and and um, they make things overnight they do they do films really super quickly and um, but it is a very thriving industry and I always loved that I loved the fact that you know in Nigeria people are constantly watching Nigerian soap operas and that's really great like how terrific you know when I was making this film in Bolivia they were always watching American soap operas dubbed over in Spanish but in Nigeria, they're watching Nigerian soap operas. And some of them are actually really good. I mean, they're not what we would call good. They're very Nigerian. Like, but they're compelling, you know? They're very local. Yeah. And, and I loved them. For, like, I, I, there are just a lot of voices out there. Right. And, I th and, and, and maybe that comes back to this idea of, you know, um, th there's a lot of sort of import-export stuff and supply well, and it demand. Well, it has to do with economics, right? I mean, this is an industry. This is a business. And, and, and if things don't get financed unless somebody thinks that there's an economic opportunity. So the thing in Nigeria is that, like, I've just never been in a country where people are so incredibly industrious. Um, maybe Cuba. Like, um, just there's this amazing energy toward, like, being able to do things to make your life work economically. And, and you see that in the film business. Um, but, may, but maybe it's not just, I mean, it's not just economics. I think it is also, maybe it's also about context. Like, you know, the fact that we wouldn't necessarily show a Nigerian uh, soap opera at a film festival in the US doesn't mean that, you know what I mean? It's like, it doesn't mean that it's not good on its own merits. It's just like the context really does make a difference. Yes. And maybe we only pay attention to things like go to Sundance and Tribeca and, you know, it's like, it's, 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 a, it's a little bit like what's allowed in a museum in some ways. Well, it's like, about what the dominant that. perspective is, like who's, who's going to consume this thing right. and how widely can it be marketed and is how much money is it going to make? I mean, it's pretty, you know, and, and certainly there are actually a lot of wealthy Nigerians who could push the film industry forward. And I, I, I don't know enough about the Nigerian film industry to actually have this conversation. But like, it, I, I would bet money that there are Nigerian entrepreneurs who are doing that because it's a clear market, right? Um, but it, a, lot of, a lot of the issue of, of local people being empowered to make films has to do with getting them the money to make movies. And getting them the money to make movies means that we have to actually think that their perspective is marketable. And part of the problem is we don't think of those perspectives as being marketable, at least not in our world, right? right? So I get, and going back to this idea of Africa as a country that needs to be saved, Joe, I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about, you, you're dealing with that head on in, in life after death. I mean, you're really dealing with aid in Africa and, 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 and this idea of, I, I guess, rescuing people or, or trying to help and it not always working, you know, unintended consequences. Was that something that, I mean, did it make, make, did making the film make you think differently about that? Or do you feel like you always had a pretty 
realistic sense of how that worked. Because I feel like um, in the film, uh, Su Suzette, Suzette yes. is, she's pretty realistic about what she can achieve in some ways. But I would imagine some people would be fairly critical even of that stance, right? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's pretty complicated. Um, I don't know, I mean, my objective was just to, to tell the stories of what they were up to on the ground over there. Um, I mean, I certainly don't have any answers of, uh, uh, you know, how to enact broad sweeping social change or reform in Africa or here or anywhere else, really. Um, but, you know, I think Dave and Suzette are, are doing good work over there, and I think they have some interesting ideas uh, further down the road of what they want to do with uh, social manufacturing, where they're actually making um, stuff in Rwanda and giving people jobs, and then through that, sending kids to school. So, I mean, that's their broader vision, and, you know, maybe it'll work and maybe it won't, but. I think it's it's an interesting angle to uh, try to you know create jobs, create stability. That seems to be a cornerstone of uh, you know comfortable life wherever you're at. I think we have a question. If there's a microphone, where's the roving mic? Just up in the front here. No worries. Thank you very much. I would like to go back to some issues that were discussed, particularly by Rachel, but this question is for all, uh, all of the people here. Um, you were talking about the stereotypes. You were talking mm -hmm. about uh, having your own repertoire of experiences of our ideas, which in a way are going to define your perspective and your choices and what you do. So when you are filming these films in Africa and about Africa, do you try to prevent uh, uh, your own um, repertoire to influence or to, to define stereotypes? How do you work with this issue, which I think, I do films in Cuba, mm -hmm. and I think that this is something very delicate, uh, and I try to prevent myself. Um, okay, it's a complicated question. Are you, are you asking, you're asking me. For you, and actually the three of you, because the three of you have that experience in Africa. I, I would say as a filmmaker, um, one of the reasons why I like making documentaries is it helps me um, engage with the world in an amazing way. And it's like this license to learn, right? It's this license to go into something that I know nothing about and like expand my heart and expand my brain and, 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 and become a bigger person, like in terms of what I can see and what I can feel. That's one I, I love that about this job, if you want to call it a job. And um, so part of that is about being extraordinarily honest with yourself about how you feel about something or what you see and being open to questioning your own point of view and being open to points of view that aren't yours and asking lots of questions and not running from stereotypes. I don't, I, I don't believe in that. I mean, I think stereotypes are important. They're important to recognize. Sometimes there's some validity to them. You know, like, okay, my family's Jewish, and there's this horrible stereotype about, you know, Jews and money. My grandfather, in many ways, was emblematic of that stereotype. Should I ignore the fact? Like, if I made a portrait of my grandfather, that that's the way he was? No, because that's who, like, he... I don't think you should be, we should be running away from stereotypes because they're tr true or false. I think we should be examining them and questioning them and, and, and acknowledging them. Does that make sense, what I'm saying? It, it, like, I, I mean, I think, I, I guess what I'm saying is it, part of the job is to be, to, to recognize what you think and to be, to recognize stereotypes when you see them and to question them. Um, but it's part of the dialogue. They're part, I mean, if we just don't, if we don't show something because it's a stereotype, if it's true, then we're ignoring an aspect of truth. Truth is extraordinarily complicated. And it has things in it that are stereotypical, and it has things in it that like completely blow the stereotype off the lid, or the lid off the stereotype, or whatever the right phrase is. But like, you can't run from the stereotype. 
just because it's stereotypical. Am I, well, am maybe, I making sense? Yeah, yeah, no, that does make sense. But I, I, maybe you could talk a little bit about this because you were dealing with uh, with archive yeah, and how that worked <clears throat> when you're looking at older footage. Sure, we're in a different situation. We Our film is only found footage. Uh, and when you work with archival material, you're in a position that you have... With, without even wanting it, without even re really striving for it, you have a contrast in the material because your eyes and the audience's eyes on this material is going to be it's going to be uh, mixed up with the experiences of the patina that is that the age of the material has already created and uh, uh, already since since the first sort of compilation films, if you want, or archival footage films, like Esfir Shoops, the, the Romanov di dynasty from, from just after the Russian Revolution, she was using the, the, the found footage from the Tsar family and just, she put it up and had little uh, ironic texts to it, but it was only a matter of a few years and the new political situation that these photos that were aiming to glorify the emperor was vilifying the emperor, you know, then th this is the fascination with working with archival footage that you have already in it a very strong tension. And, and uh, in this film concerning violence that, that is here at, at True Falls, um, the stereotypes from this age is very similar to those of today and, and therefore it's also very sort of um, gratifying or, or, or um, it's, it's um, useful to work with because uh, the, your eye on, on, on the stereotypes from them means is also a way of, of, of making aware the, the common days, the, the today's, today's stereotypes. It's, 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 it's a, the, the, the archival experience is, is a good way of analyzing stereotypes. And do you think maybe it's a particular responsibility of documentary filmmakers because we are slightly outside of the market in some ways? Um, uh, I'm just thinking, you know, like maybe one of the reasons that this idea of stereotype comes up so much is because when you think about print journalism and you think about what we see on the news, so much of it is not that thoughtful actually and only very specific things are focused on and often people don't spend very much time and I mean this is not all the, always the case I know but in general I feel like especially when with stories about Africa portrayed outside of Africa you are dealing with a lot of really really bad reportage and really bad stories yeah. very badly told um, often very very offensive often leaving out the most interesting nuances and so maybe it is as documentary filmmakers that you, you know because I think documentary comes at things from a slight angle, and you do tend to spend more time with your subjects. Maybe that's where you get to really tease out some of that stuff. So it's not ignoring stereotypes, but it's just that it's not an article that you have to write overnight. Well, I think you hit on something that's really important in terms of her question, which has to do with complication, right? It's, it's that the world is a complicated, complex place, and many things can be true at the same time. And that's what makes it interesting. And so, it's not just a question of recognizing when stereotypes are confronting them or not fulfilling them. It's a question of, of, of trying to understand the reality of what you're seeing in front of you in a complex way. And stereotypes are by definition simple, right? They're, they're, they're very, very simple. So um, yeah, that's like a challenge. It's a, I think it is, a, as a white person going to a predominantly black place, um, you're, you're having to deal with a racial issue, too, that, uh, that has all sorts of colonial issues embedded in it. Um, and, and there are lots, because of what I was saying before about marketing and like the dominant narrative being how we see the world as white people coming from places with money, um, you know, that's gonna be part of what you're dealing with as you're making your film in a place like like Ghana or Nigeria, um, and you can just, you, you shouldn't, I don't think you should run from it, but you should recognize it. And I feel, I feel like maybe sometimes when people really face that, I, I don't know, did any of you see Enjoy Poverty? Mm -mm. Did you see that? Mm -hmm. So I mean, that film caused a lot, people really hated it. I mean, he was booed, people walked out, 
uh, it, it was not, I don't think it went down very well in most of the screenings I saw, but I, and I, I understand why, but I also, this is a film where he, he basically um, unpacks a lot of the stuff, but he's an artist, and so he kind of makes a lot of what he's doing into kind of an art project, and people felt it was very, very exploitative. But I actually thought that he was like hitting on some really interesting, and like the uncomfortableness for me was exactly the uncomfortableness I thought we should be feeling, mm -hmm. and, um, and and the conversations were really interesting that came out of it. But it did make me think like, is it ever possible to make a pro project like that that doesn't feel like that when you're, you know, a white person in Africa and you're in and out, you know, like he was there and then he left. And I think one of the things that's also really interesting about all of us, right, is that you go in and then you leave. And, and, and I think it's a lot like that with a lot of yeah. business, business in Africa too. It's like you go in, you get what you need, and then you get out, and you're not actually invested in what happens there when you leave, because it's not where you live. Yeah. <laughs> and, 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 so may, and maybe that wouldn't be as much of a problem if there was a lot of stories that were coming, that were being created there, and, and it, like if the, if the stories were flowing in more directions, then I'm sure probably we wouldn't be having this panel, because then everyone would just be making films, and some would be good and some would be bad, and the conversations would be, you know, they would be what they are, but because of the fact that actually it is always people going in and then leaving, I think that's why we end up with, that's why we end up with panels like this. Yeah, no, for, for us in, in our company, we've been working with films uh, in Africa before, but this just, the, the problem you mentioned with going in and, and going out and, and grabbing things and, and, and leaving has also left us with such a, we, we actually, one of the films we made from Africa was only a recorded interview with, with it was the short film Hidden, it won a uh, short film prize in, in, at IDFA, and it was uh, only uh, sound recordings with a young uh, Sudanese, uh, two young Sudanese children that was later animated with like sort of African motifs and, and so it was an animated do documentary which is a genre that is sort of expanding by I think reasons of representation problems. Um, and also this one we try not to go in and out because this is, leaves such a bitter taste in the mouth really. Yeah. And I, yeah, and I wonder actually, Joe, if you like with uh, Tina delivers a goat. I mm -hmm. felt like that short film. I mean, it was what two minutes. Yeah, that expressed all of this in two minutes. <laughs> so it wasn't. It, I mean, the whole thing for me was like this. She shows up randomly. I mean, may, may, uh, like there may have been context that I didn't get, but it felt like it was almost like t Tina attacks with a goat, and then leaves. And I, and I, of course, I understand that she was helping or trying <clears> to help, <throat> but it felt very, very critical to me. Well, the thing is is that was kind of an accident. I mean, the only reason I made that was I just got the footage and I thought it was going to be funny because Tina's funny and Tina with a goat is even more funny. And it's like, you just, you, you walk away with whatever you come into it with. I mean, if you don't like what she's doing, you're not going to like the film. And if you do <laughs> like what she's doing, you're going to like the film. Well, you're going to like the film either way. But. <laughs> There's a question, oh, hang on, but yeah, but just before we get to the question, I, yeah, I see what you mean, but I mean, there was, you, well, can you say, I mean, how did you feel about it? Because to me, it felt very, it well, felt critical, but in a very sort of loving way. People think that, like, it's some big issue, it's like some big comment, but honestly, I hate to <laughs> blow my own cover, but it's, really, it's, uh, that all came afterwards from the interpretations, I mean... I make films in Africa because I work for Dave and Suzette, um, I, I'm not over there because I'm like trying to push issues. I'm just trying to tell the stories in front of me. So it's, it is kind of an unusual situation that I ever even ended up over there at all, um, which is why my film probably isn't it's a little bit of a different tone than the other two. You know, um, I just want to make small films about r normal people and I would make the same type of film here, I would, I would, and I just happened to have an opportunity to do it in Africa, so that's how that came around. Tina Delivers a Goat is online, so you can, you can check it out. Um, yeah, Christian. Uh, I just wanted to go back to how you all keep referring to yourselves as a group of white people exploring uh, a black continent, 
And I was just wondering, because ultimately these documentaries are for an outsider audience. Mm -hmm. So do you think, so what's wrong with embracing an outsider perspective? Do you think that's wrong? Or no. is that something you try to avoid? You, I mean, that's your, per you, all you have to work with is who you are. You know, we're not, you, you, can't, you don't want to try and be something you're not. That's like, your art is you. The thing you have to say comes from you. So, you know, I mean, the things that you were talking about, about stereotypes and stuff, like uh, embracing your own perspective in all of its shades of whatever shades your perspective might be. Like, it, it, that's, that's what makes good work, right? So it's not, I mean, I don't think we should deny the fact that we have an outsider's perspective. We should try and help more local perspectives to get out there because I think that's really important. We are not going to make you know, African movie, like th th we keep talking about it as the continent, right? But, you know, I'm not gonna make a Nigerian film or a Ghanaian film that's like the same film that, Nigeria is different because there really is this incredibly vital film in industry there. Um, but I'm not trying to make a film with that perspective because that's not my perspective and I can only do what I can do. And I don't think there's anything wrong with making films about places that you're not from or people that you're not of. I mean, that's fine. I mean, more than not anything wrong. I mean, surely that's what makes There's everything this great, really interesting. I was just at this film festival in Montreal. I keep talking about this because I really loved it. I saw, they had this Marcel Ofus re retrospective and there was this amazing film there called A la recherche de mon Amérique, which in, yikes, in translation means, um, Seeking My America, but he called it something else in English, I can't remember what. It's never been shown in North America other than this like secret retrospective where I don't think they actually had the rights to show it, but they did. And it was amazing, and it's this film by this French-German guy who had gone to school in America, who comes to America and makes this film about sort of the status quo of America in the late 60s, early 70s. And it's a portrait of American culture at the time from this guy's perspective. And it's amazing. It's just amazing. I, like, I want everyone to see it. I, it. But it's part of the thing that makes it amazing is that it's a, an outsider coming to America, seeing these things that are going on that are so incredibly important and vital that he's noticing and highlighting in it. I mean, he's an amazing filmmaker, but his perspective is not of the place. And so he notices all sorts of things that like people of the place might not notice. And that's really cool, you know? But it's not the only way to tell a story. And so part of the problem with the whole dialogue that we're having here is that generally speaking, the films that we get to see from the continent of Africa are from, made by people who are not from the continent of Africa going there to make a film. Right. And that's sort of the problem. Well, and more broadly than that, more broadly than that, it's also surely that, you know, it would be re like, I think all of us really like this idea of, you know, being able to go places and discover worlds that we don't know so much about. And that's what makes us curious and, and what makes the world so exciting. But it's this idea of what inf the information only ever flown in one way. And if there were more African filmmakers, um, coming and making films about America or making films about France or whatever it is, then I think that, again, we wouldn't be having this conversation Absolutely. or at least all these issues wouldn't feel as fraught. That's it's right. only because of the flow, the way that money, information and people flow, um, it, because it is so unfair. It's people from a rich world talking about a world with less money. Yeah. And it's always that way around. And it's always that way. And, it, and, and that's the problem. I mean, that's why I always come back to the economics of it. But it is an economic problem. It's like rich people talking about poor people all the time. And, and, and it's not that all Africans are poor because they're not. But that's like part of the problem, right? It's like, um, which is what we were discussing. But it's, it's it, they're just, I think that is the essence. You've got to have. Um, we're just going to come here and then we'll go over there. So what kind of a responsibility do you feel that documentary filmmakers telling true stories of what things really are, um, what kind of responsibility do you all have <coughs> to actually maybe help? Or do you f how do you feel your films did help to break stereotypes and tell uh, truth? Or was it, is it just pure economics? Or uh, how do you feel you have a responsibility to help? You mean, so you make a film and then, and then what else happens? Yeah, because like, 
and the concerning violence, it, it made it look like all white people who live in Africa hate blacks and want to dominate them and make them slaves, <clears throat> when you know that's not the truth. But it's, it could look like that. And it's not true, we know, but that's a, enforcing the stereotype. And then, um, you know, the, we, we saw some negative stereotypes. I haven't seen Big Men, but I actually I want to see it. It looks really good. Cool. And, uh, but it seemed to enforce, from what the preview was, it enforced a lot of negative stereotypes. Um, well, the reason why I brought up the whole stereotype thing is because it's something I'm very conscious of in my own film. There are a lot of images of Africa <coughs> in my film that are stereotypical images. They just so happen to be true. I mean, that's part of the problem, right? You know, that, that, that these images are true. And, and so, um, which is why I went into my whole thing about not running away from stereotypes, because it's... But maybe going beyond st stereotypes, do you feel that your films need to then create change, change in the no, world? No, that's not why I'm, I make films. I mean, I think, I think there are, I, you know, I, I think it comes, I've only made, directed two, two movies but there's nothing like putting a movie out in the world to make you feel like really powerless in a certain way. Like, it, like it's just like totally beyond your control. You know, you make this thing and you like, you let it go and then people take it and they interpret it and they, now with the internet, they post it all over the world and like, you can hope, I think if you're making an issue oriented film with a goal, then I think there's real, you know, you can really try and advocate specific change. Um, but in terms of, I, I mean, I think we're all just trying to add our own voices uh, in a conscious way. How about you, Joe? Do you feel like uh, you need to see change? Personally, I mean, if the film helps others over there, that's great. I mean, I think, um, I don't know. I mean, I just, I just want to try to make a little bit more sense of the world. I think that's our job, is to, to, to make a little sense of the world. And this was just a glimpse of what's going on in this place, you know, 20 years after something really horrible happened. You know, I've been a little confused by the direction the discussion has gone, because the title of the panel is Africa is not a country, and yet I feel you're speaking about it as if it were mm -hmm. a country, where it's a very diverse continent mm -hmm. when you compare North Africa to South Africa to mm -hmm. East Africa. Um, they have diverse problems, they have diverse successes. It, it, there are very many different things going on, and I do think that we in this country tend to think of it as all being the same. And I haven't really heard anything different from you. Uh, yeah, I, that's a good, the, very good question. I was just about to say, we, I've noticed <laughs> that we do keep talking about Africa. Well, I think it has to do, I think we keep talking about Africa because of the title of the panel and sort of the, the, the format of the question. But I don't, I, I mean, I haven't seen your films. But I don't, I, I would be shocked if anyone who spent any time in any specific country would say, or multiple countries, on the continent of Africa, like they're really different. You know and I, I think mean? that is, I mean, to be fair, I do also think that that is something that really does come out in the three films. Um, yeah, well, in, 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 in the case of concerning violence, our job is to generalize to a certain amount, um, but also to weigh that generalization towards something that brings in nuances and, and points to the differences. and. and I think this is, we're talking about stereotypes, and uh, for us, like, uh, returning to your question there, that we, <coughs> not only did we sort of try to put out the, the, the negative stereotypes of the white men in, in, in Africa, but we also tried to show the helplessness of the colonizing people there, <laughs> sort of. They're left in this situation where they can't really they don't have, not have they, they don't have a clue why they're there really, and uh, this is a, this is a main, you know, object to show the complexity of of, of this situation. Um, you know, the point has been made that the um, you guys are going in making movies, white perspective coming away, showing Africa with your 
point of view. And Rachel, I think you were saying that Africa, there's a, there's a burgeoning industry of filmmakers. In Nigeria. Yeah. In Nigeria. Mm -hmm. In general, are there, well, we hear, well then you mentioned soap operas. Yeah, Is they're, there they're really actually making amazing. Documentaries, Africans making documentaries. I, I don't know enough about. You might know the answer to that more than I do. I don't. There's, there's a problem. That there's no real public service. Uh, there's, there's, there's no fund. Them. There's no funds. There's no public service. There's no infrastructure Desire for to it. Do it. Are there of Africans course. that you know that well, wish they were making their What about their own the stories? Encounters documentary? Yeah, no, there, I mean, there are, there, are, there are actually lots of really, really um, amazing... Especially uh, in South Africa. In South Africa, but beyond South Africa. Um, but the problem, it's, you know, it, a lot of it, I think, comes down to money. A and distribution, actually, because I just met with a bunch of South African... Uh, the South African... Um, what are they called? Um, uh, what's it called when you have, like, a travelling film... Anyway, at Sundance, and they were saying that one of the problems is not just funding, it's distribution. And the distribution system in South Africa is, I mean, there aren't, that, there aren't enough people to really like, distribute just within South Africa and make a lot of money. People who would pay to go to the cinema, for example. That was my next question, is are Africans in different African countries interested in seeing their own stories told? Here we are at a documentary film festival all interested in all these different stories. Are, is there that kind of interest in Africa where people would like to see documentaries well, about Africa? Just before they, they answer, so what, what, what I was going to say is that what they were saying is there were a couple of filmmakers there who had discovered these really awesome ways of getting around it, a little bit like the sort of DIY distribution systems that are emerging everywhere. And there was one guy who would basically sell his DVDs at market stalls um, you know, all over South Africa, and he was banking it. And, those, and they were selling incredibly well. These, these were feature films, not documentaries. Incredibly well. He was doing very well. But he'd had to work his way around the system because the system wasn't set up for a healthy film industry. And, you know, like, I mean, I think we should acknowledge that film is tricky everywhere. It's a weird industry. It's like a, it straddles art and finance in a very strange way, which is why often you have to have money coming outside of the market. You know, public funding, government <coughs> funding, philanthropy, whatever it is. I think it's weird everywhere. Um, and, and I think acknowledging the realities of, of how that stuff circulates in different countries is part of why we see certain films coming, in, emerging from different places and how, and I think some of those stories do tend to stay put, like Nigeria, for example. Um, but, but I think it's really hard to get away from the, like how this stuff actually gets created and circulated. Yeah. Well, there's actually, can I, can I say something about her question? Um, I mean, first of all, it's not fair to talk about people in general about their desires and stuff, but I can, in, in a different context, I made this film called Our Brand is Crisis about these American political consultants who went to, Boli including James Carville, who go to Bolivia and run a presidential campaign down there for a guy who wants to be president of Bolivia. And when I finished it, um, it ended up getting uh, like stolen and put on DVDs and projected on the sides of walls in Bolivia. And I actually, stealing, pirating my work actually does bother me because I don't make any money. But in, in Bolivia, I didn't mind it because it's, it's a story about Bolivia, and it's like, if that's how they're going to see it, then so be it, you know, projected on the side of a wall. And it actually became like kind of a big deal there, my film, because I had this amazing access. And I was given that amazing access in part because I was a foreigner. And it, the way I had gotten to it was, I mean, I've, I've t made these two films about Americans going to other places doing these crazy things that have to do with power and money, right? But um, there's real interest in, in that film in Bolivia because it has this vital perspective on something that's about Bolivia that like nobody in Bolivia would have ever gotten permission to make, right? What? There's your next movie. Oh, no, no, no. No, my next movie is going to be in America. <laughs> um, but, but this, the big man, I think there would be similar... I, I had two children over the course of making my film, and I have not yet managed to go to either Nigeria or Ghana to show the film. There's a real possibility that I will show the film in April in, um, in Ghana. And I imagine, I mean, I imagine that people would be very interested in this film in Ghana because it's got amazing access to this thing that's about their, where, where they are. And it's crazy access that nobody there has managed to get. So, you know, of course, I mean, people are interested in like the inside scoop on, on what's happening there, just like we would be interested in an inside scoop. 
But distribution clearly is, a, is a, an issue. That's a here. huge issue. Um, I have a question for the three of you. I guess, Rachel, you talked early on kind of about how you position, your, position yourself when you're making the film. And I wanted to ask all three of you how you thought about positioning yourself within the film itself. I mean, I think these are all great films and also films that are, um, to a certain extent, kind of make an attempt to kind of show the hand of the maker in it. I mean, Tobias, obviously, it's, it's a kind of a visual essay, so there's nothing naturalistic about it and you have voiceover and you have on-screen text and chapter headings and found footage so it's very obvious that someone has put this you know Rachel your kind of off-screen interviewing voice has kind of uh, kind of become a motif in the two movies that you made I mean it's very um present and it just that the tone of your voice and the fact that you're almost always a woman talking to men I mean just makes your presence very clear there and, and Joe in your movie just the, even the way it's shot it was even the, the movie is a very strong visual style. You're sometimes using this kind of, you know, off-center framing that makes it very clear that it's being chosen. You know, the colors are uh, very bright. Even the way you, uh, the subtitles were used in that clip that we saw, saw is kind of calling attention to itself a little bit. So I wonder if that's, you know, if that is something you, you thought about and how you thought about um, making your own presence or covering it over in the films that you all made. Well, I think, I mean, my favorite films, my favorite filmmakers, documentary filmmakers, all have a very strong editorial voice. And, you know, there's, there's no use trying to hide who's making the thing. I mean, it, it's us saying something. It's a filmmaker saying something. And, you know, with the humor I used and the cuts and the shots, I mean, that's just kind of, you know, the language and the words I use to tell the story. So I, I, I don't have a problem that there's a very strong editorial stamp on the film. Yeah, likewise, uh, I, my favorite films are all with very like, obvious uh, uh, voices behind them. And this is how, how I think this is the most honest way to, to be a filmmaker. And this is what I think is interesting. Otherwise, if you try to hide as a, as a, as a filmmaker and, and uh, it just becomes fake to me. I, for me, your, film, your question's more of a filmmaking question. And I am, um, my two films are very related in that way. Uh, and for me, my voice, both of these films, they're kind of like a pair in a certain way, because they're about very similar. Um, they're very similar in many ways. Uh, and one of the similarities is that I am generally dealing with people who have a lot of interest in not revealing themselves. And in that sense, I discovered very early on the importance of the question in creating a conversation, um, especially if you're dealing with like a spin doctor or something, right? Like they have a response and it's, it's a great response. And then you can do something with the question that then turns the response, you, you get more out of the dialogue than you would out of just a, like so my voice became, in that film, in the first film, it became, I discovered how it could work. And then in the second film, I used it kind of again to my advantage, because in a certain, it, it, I'm not interested in, in, there are certain editors, for example, you'll work with the editor and they'll always cut out your question in the interview and I'll be like, no, 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 <laughs> we gotta use that, you know, because it gives it context or it creates it creates a conversation which then takes it beyond being an interview and turns it into something else that's more cinematic in my <coughs> mind. I, I'm interested in the conversation more than I'm interested in the interview. Right, because a lot, and a lot of filmmakers were kind of trained their subject in the course of an interview to put the question, to put the question back into the Yeah, I, that's, to me, that always, I, I've certainly worked on films for other people where we've had to do that, and I, I've tried it myself. It doesn't work for me. Like in terms of what feels right to me, it just doesn't feel right to me. And I think different films demand different techniques and different tools, and it just so happens that the two films that I have made so far have both demanded, in my opinion, um, a dialogue in order to get at some deeper truth that the answer itself is not gonna give me what I want, that it's gonna be in the back and forth that I get something real. Well, and there's also, I mean, it feels like in, I especially noticed it in big men, um, you know, you, because you're dealing with people who are often quite powerful or think they're quite powerful and, and, and do have things to hide, I mean, you're, you're, 
there is, it is interesting hearing the way you ask questions because you can hear that you're trying to put them at ease oh, really? and get them to reveal themselves a little bit, I think. Like, you sound like you're being really, really nice to them sometimes, but you are asking harsh questions just in a really Rachel Boynton type <laughs> way. Well, I... Because I heard that the audience draw breath sometimes when you were speaking. Really? Yeah. Oh, that's nice to hear. But, I, you, but you sound like you're being really, really, like, nice, but you're making them say things they don't want to say. <laughs> Well, okay. This is a trick. <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean, there's, you hinted at it. My, my husband, I've said this before, but my husband jokes that I should have a film company called White Men in Suits. Um, and it just happens to be these subjects that I have, at, to this point in my career, been drawn to. Um, but it, the fact that I'm a woman uh, plays a part in the dialogue, of course. And um, the fact that I'm dealing with white men in suits who are uh, in pretty powerful positions often. Occasionally black men in suits who are in powerful positions too, but like men in suits always. <laughs> question there? Uh, yeah, this is a question mostly for Joe. Um, <laughs> I was just wondering how uh, you found, how you came to meet your subject and how you knew that he was the perfect person to focus on whenever you're trying to encapsulate Rwanda and the normal people that live there after that tragedy? Well, uh, a lot of people in that generation are pretty pretty reserved um, in, in front of the cameras. Um, so I go over there with Dave and Suzette, um, and I was doing some work with them, and uh, I just met Kwasa through Suzette, and he was just so charismatic, uh, and I was like, I have to spend some time with this guy, because you could tell that you know, he was just extremely funny and would make for a, a, a great, you know, he could really hold the center on a film. Okay. Yeah, I was just thinking about um, this idea of, like, documentaries about Africa not coming out as much from Africans themselves and just having seen so many films like Redemption in General by Naked, Blood in the Mobile, uh, just a ton of films. And I'm thinking, it's yeah, it's all white people that I've, mm -hmm. I've seen make them and go up there and... And then thinking about every product is, that it's successful is made because it scratches an itch, right? And I'm, you're, you're saying in um, Nollywood that these films are made because people want that maybe escapism. And I, when yeah, I, I did a documentary sure. in Africa and I went into the slum of Kibera and a guy, he had a couple cameras, yeah. but he did all journalism because that was how he got paid. But right. he wasn't out thinking, can I make a documentary about the second largest slum in Africa? <laughs> he was thinking... How can I make money? And so I'm wondering, do you guys think that maybe documentaries aren't coming out of Africa because there isn't this, it doesn't scratch some kind of itch? No, I think it has to do with what was embedded in your question, which is about money. Mm -hmm. All my answers go back to money. But it's, it, it, people need to make a living. And if you're gonna be, if you're really, if you're really rich, you can afford, or if, if your husband's really rich, or if somebody's rich, you can afford to go out and make movies and not make money. And then you can make a movie about whatever you want, and you can take as long as you want, and like, that's great. If you need to make a living, somebody needs to pay you for your time. Your time, time and money are very related. People need to earn. And in these places where people are not, pay there are no entities that are paying people locally to make documentaries. It doesn't exist. Like, I mean, maybe I'm just ignorant, and maybe somebody out there knows more than I do, but I don't know, like, in Nigeria or, or in Ghana, of local institutions paying filmmakers to go out and make documentaries about their world. And until they get paid for their work, how in the world are they supposed to do it? And I mean, I feel like that's almost another panel, like the privilege of documentaries and, and who gets to make documentaries anywhere, because, you know, in my experience, most documentary filmmakers make a living doing something else. Yeah. Um, and if you go to film festivals, it's a very particular audience often. Um, so, you know, there is something around privilege and documentary too, uh, I think, that is wrapped up in it. It's, and that's a much broader conversation, I think. But I think a lot of that taps into that too. I mean, everyone needs to make a... Well, most people need to make a living. Um, and, and documentary making is not always a living. No. Well, just... You know, as an American, in America, it's almost impossible to get a film made. And we're the richest country in the history of civilization. I mean... But we have no government support for film, basically. Well, I mean, just even as a wealthy society, there's money sloshing around somewhere. And, you know, places like Rwanda, you know, how do you even get your hands on a camera half the time? 
think it was a question back there. I had a question that goes back to access and privilege. Um, Rachel, you had talked about how being a white Westerner gave you this unbelievable access. And I guess I'm curious to know more about how you feel about that and that someone from the country might not have had that access. Well, there are a lot of white Westerners who didn't get the access. So I, I don't think it's just because I'm a white Westerner. Um, I do think... Uh, I mean, have you seen my film? No. Okay. It's a film about a bunch of white Westerners. So, I mean, at its base, um, in its backbone. The spinal cord of the movie is about a bunch of white Westerners. <laughs> and, and so in that sense, I don't think it's unusual that a white Westerner is making my particular film. And as I, we were talking about before, I've n I never really conceived of my film as a film about Africa. For me, it was a, a film about the gears of the world. And, and it's a film about the connections between people and, and how they're alike. But just, just going back to this idea of Africa is not a country, um, do you think your <laughs> film is a film about Africa, oil in Africa or, or natural resources in Africa? Or is it specifically about Ghana and Nigeria? Or is it not about either of those particular two countries? Oh, it's, I mean, it's a film about, hopefully a, a good film works on a lot of different levels, right? Yeah. I mean, like, you, I mean, a good, a good movie will have layers of meaning and one person can look at it and say, hey, this is a movie about the resource curse. And somebody else can look at it and say, actually, this is a film about, this is an adventure film about capitalism. And, and both are true. So uh, the film tracks an incredibly important piece of Ghanaian history. The discovery of a massive new oil field in a country that has never had oil is a major thing for the history of a country. And so in that sense, it's very much a film about Ghana. It's also a film about Nigeria, because I was also filming in Nigeria. Um, but the Nigeria piece of the movie is used, <sighs> it's used in a way that's sort of more emblematic rather than specific, if that makes sense. Um. Hi, over here. For Tobias, this is, perhaps the answer to this question is so simple, it'll take five seconds, but I'm curious because I've had a few conversations since seeing your film with people who had very interesting conversations about the choice of your narrator. Um, Lauren Hill narrates the film, which is, is it as simple as a recognized name and a voice, um, or was that a, a more thoughtful decision, and how did you come to that? Because it's it's a pretty interesting choice in a film that is, and she plays such a significant role in the film because she talks us through the whole thing in so many ways. So I'm curious what your thought on that is and why you chose that in the in that con yeah. in that context. Uh, yeah, thanks. Uh, it's um, Lauren Hill is one of many narratives. Actually, this is the first version we're going to make. We're just now uh, finishing the. Uh, Swedish, Danish, Finnish version, but also the French, Portuguese, Italian, Farsi, Arabic, um, German, Swahili, Mandarin. We, 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 all of these, because this film, those of you who have seen the film, you'll, you'll, you'll know that this is a film that you cannot possibly subtitle. So we have to make versions. And this is also for us a good way of reaching out because there we would hope to find in every of these language territor territories someone that speaks directly to, to the audience that we want to reach. And Lauren Hill was, yeah, for the, for the, for the sort of, the, well, <clears throat> this is not the whole truth because we had other voices in mind when we also, uh, but she was very high up on the list when we discussed uh, who to narrate the text. And we have uh, a common friend in, in the associate producer of the film, Corey Smith. He was, also, he was the music pr producer for our previous film, The Black Power Mixtape. And he knows Lauren. And he and our co-producer here in the US, Jocelyn Barnes, tipped us, off, tipped us off that she could be very interested in this. Uh, Yeah, well, um, African, Africa is not a country, so there's many languages in Africa. There's going to be one uh, narrator, narrator for, for each language. And unfortunately, um, our way to reach the most people with the least effort will be to use the 
colonizer's language. So we're gonna, it's, you know, it's Portuguese, it's, it's French, but also, like I said, Swahili, and uh, yeah, we're gonna. Uh, but uh, coming back to, to Lauren, uh, our question to her reached her when she, when she was in prison. Uh, she was spend, spending winter in prison, uh, no, sorry, the autumn in prison in the US. And she was actually just, when she got the question, returning to the text of Fanon that she was reading as a, as a university, university student. So she was, we barely had to persuade her. She was, she was on board just before, almost before getting the question. But quite a controversial choice because to have an American reading Fanon's Yeah, I voice know, I know. And this, this, was, a, this was an issue. And, and when we showed the film to Gayatri Spivak, who's, who's writing the preface for the film, she was very critical of our choice of having this inherently sort of oppressing, as she feels, voice uh, telling the story of the oppressed. And um, yeah, this was something that we needed to discuss. We made five recordings with, uh, with Lauren uh, to make it a bit less sort of, well, she was very, she was much more accented American in the first readings and much more aggressive. And then we sort of toned her down, toned, toned her personality, or we, you know, it's, her personality became less the issue in the la later readings. You wore it down. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, anyway, that's, that's how it was. Hi. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. This is a question for Joe. Um, the idea of being a filmmaker in, res filmmaker in residence, excuse me, um, <coughs> sort of seems to me like an interesting one, and I wonder, um, given sort of your working relationship with your subjects, um, sort of how you navigated that um, about sort of what you brought up and what you didn't, sort of around questions of maybe uh, colonialism or religion and colonialism or just sort of sort of just how your working relationship is sort of both given such a close collaboration with your subjects in your film. I mean, those are all just big, big things. And when it comes right down to it, it's just me and them trying to get a movie together. I mean, so I'm not thinking really about colonialism when we're producing. I'm just thinking about like what their plans are for the day. Because that's, you know, I mean, that's what it comes down to. And all that other stuff, I mean, I think that is attached afterwards uh, through the lens of who's ever interpreting it. Okay, we have time for one more question, as long as it's a, is it a quick question, is it a yes or no question? <laughs> pressure, pressure. Is it like a yes know. or no okay, question? Ask it yes or no, kind of. Um, back to the idea of the panel, um, you guys are up there because you guys made documentaries and spent time over there in individual countries learning, I mean, their cultures, meeting their people. Uh, I did, honestly, as, as in the topic of Africa is not a country, how is, your, how is it, in your opinion, have your feelings change from making a documentary, maybe meeting people there, talking to them, not necessarily about making your own documentaries, but like, I mean, just the, the broad concept of Africa is not a country. Wait, so d did it change their idea yeah, I mean, of Africa as a sort of monolithic? Yeah, ideas, and like, did they, do they feel more strongly about the topic or? I mean, yes or no? No, I'm kidding. <laughs> yes or no? <laughs> no, you can answer. Well, uh, it was, I don't know if he was just asking me, but I, 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 um, ch making my film radically altered the way I see the world. Radically. I mean, I'm like a different person from making my film, but for sure. But it's not about just, Af it's not like how I see Africa. It's about how I see, see it, everything. Like it radically affected me. Tobias? I didn't spend one day in Africa, I'm sorry to say. <laughs> I was in the archives. Yeah. But, but sure, I learned a lot, like you do in all, all of these processes. And those archives are extraordinary for anyone who hasn't seen Concerning Violence yet, really extraordinary. Joe? Yeah, I mean, I've, I've spent about 10, 12 weeks on the ground in Africa, and you know, just like any place, going there will change your relationship with it, so it's, I don't think it's really an African thing, it's just a, more of a travel thing. Well, I mean, the whole... Uh, it's about seven billion different answers there. Yeah. You, I thought you wanted a short question. Like, what is that, man? Yeah, thanks for rephrasing it like that. Yeah, yeah I mean, I th you know, yes, I think no. what's really interesting <laughs> about the whole 
I think what's interesting about the panel and actually the way that it's sort of, like you said, you know, we, we, we ended up talking about Africa as a country again, is I think it does touch on the fact that this is, it is an issue that we're all grappling with and we well, do keep getting... We talk, about, uh, we talk about Europe. I mean, this is a little different because Europe, it, there is a European Union. There's an African Union Continent. too. Right. I mean, there is unity there. I mean, it's not without its identity. There, there's a whole political history about African identity. So, you know, there are reasons why we talk about Africa that aren't entirely, you know, about the white man or woman talking about another continent. There... The, but it, it just has to do with recognizing the stereotypes and broadening the way you see the world in general. Great. Well, I think that's a good note to end on. <laughs> um, I'm sorry we didn't solve the problem of uh, <laughs> power and privilege and race and, right. and, and all these other things, but I'm glad we started to at least touch the surface. Thank you to my panelists.